Last Sunday afternoon, I preached a sermon dealing with the errors, the sin of denominationalism. We explained what we meant, and we did that not only just to know about what the Bible has to say about the matter, but to emphasize our study beginning today on several different denominations. It's important to recognize the Lord's view of things. I can't emphasize that enough. We need to adopt how the Lord sees things. Thus the sermon of the last week. Now today I would like to begin this by examination of the Baptist Church. Now when I say the Baptist Church, if you're familiar with anything to do with them, you'll realize there is not just one Baptist Church, all of them believing the same thing. So we're going to begin with what and they call themselves this, what's called the Primitive Baptist. They'll also refer to themselves as Hardshell Baptist. And we're beginning here because when you get into the study of the history of our nation, religious matters, they were basically the first Baptists to be in America. And then there are what's called the missionary Baptists and free will Baptists, and there are then other smaller groups or different divisions. They readily and freely admit they have among themselves. The first regularly organized Baptist church was founded in 1607 in London by Mr. Smith S.M.I.T.H. He was a former clergyman, if you call him that, of the Church of England. That's when they began the history of Baptist page 304. Now, when you begin to study these different encyclopedias, you learn different things about him, but all of them seem to say he was his morals are a good man and a devout man. No one knows when he became a Baptist. No one can figure that one out. Uh, different ones have different views of where he was baptized, when he was baptized, who baptized him, at least according to Sheriff Herzog and Encyclopedia, Logging 3, page 2202. But that same encyclopedia says the Baptists started with America in a similar manner. Was Ezekiel Solomon baptized Roger Williams, and Mr. Williams in turn baptized Richard Solomon and several others. Pages 2531 to 2532. Now the Baptist Encyclopedia says that Roger Williams was publicly baptized in verse sometime in the month of March 1639. And thus what is called, commonly called or regarded as the oldest Baptist church in America was founded. At this time, and that is Encyclopedia Volume 2, page 1252. Fellow by the name of H. C. Vetter says it was sometime about March of 1639 that William was baptized by Ezekiel Holland, who had been a member of his church, as he used it, in Salem. Afterward, William baptized ten others, and this resulted in the formation of the first. Baptist Church in America. That's a short history of the Baptist, page 291. Benedict says, the layman, thus of the preaching category according to their view of things, was selected for the purpose of doing the first baptizing. That's for Benedict's history of the Baptist. But, but, the name Baptist was not at first adopted by the Bill. In fact, they preferred to call themselves brethren, disciples of Christ, Christians, believers, and certain other names like that. That's from Age of Human History of Baptist Churches in the United States, page 1, introduction. In 1644, the name Baptist was first claimed by these people who have claimed it ever since. W.H. Whitsitt, the question of Baptist history, page 93. One of the things I want to emphasize about the uncertainty of when the Baptist church as such came to existence 
is that it has long been thought that the restoration efforts in the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland in particular, uh, had produced what can be compared to the New Testament teaching or pattern for the church, but it never gained a whole lot of hold, it looks like. But we don't know for sure. That many of those churches who were on the right track back in the 1600s deviated and turned into Baptist churches. But Ken Chudley was a much younger man for a long time ago since he'd been dead for several years. Uh, he told me that he visited one of these old church buildings. It was a Baptist church. It is a Baptist church today. And that the preacher came out and visited with him for a while and they talked about the history of things. And he went into the Baptist church and brought out a communion set. And by this day, Ken, this really belongs to you, not us. Because they were one time a symbol there. They were known simply as Christians. They had elders and deacons. And they worshiped on the first day of the week. And we took the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. They even back to church. This I have. It's a copy that's in our own handwriting of the, of the members of this one particular congregation up in the north. And I've actually been to that building that still stands. Baptist Church. So I strongly thought that many of these that became Baptist over there had actually apostatized out of very close, if not, of the Lord's Church. And uh, that's one reason to admit they is exactly when did these people become Baptist as we know them today. But you will notice as we go down through here that these that we know as primitive Baptists are as Calvinistic as it possible to be. And that's, that's what gets sweeping over everything in Europe to begin with in the world of Lutheranism. So when we consider these things, we'll look at it from a standpoint and we won't cover everything. But basically, the basic difference is oh, let me mention this. The Primitive Baptist Church does not consider itself a denomination, it believes it is the church of which you read in the New Testament. Don't make that mistake, did you? So I'm not busy beforehand. And another thing that you might run across, especially if you're looking up singing on the internet to some of these groups, and you'll realize these people are not the Church of Christ singing, but they don't have any categories for music. And guess what? The Reverend Baptists do not use the categories for music, and they think it's wrong to do so. So they separate themselves from other Baptists, and yet they are probably, not probably they are, uh, more consistently Calvinistic than about any, any group today, at least as much as any group today. So this leads us down then to uh, the government report that I want to know the back, so I'll have to do page 84, and uh, talking about this branch, it, it, it emphasizes that it belongs to the Calvinistic or particular, particular branch. They grew, in, they grew into uh, areas of influence like that of the Philadelphia Association. It is stated by W. J. McLaughlin in the Baptist Confessions of Faith on page 299 that the first of the Philadelphia Baptist Confessions of Faith appeared on September 25th, 1742. Now, mind you, this is just, all, just around 100 years before Campbell and those men really started their work, which would have been around 1820s. And they were, as they labored to go back to the Bible, the Bible only is their only rule of faith and practice for a time, involved with the Baptists. Some people try to say, well, they came out of the Baptist church. No, they were allowed them to preach strictly from the Bible, and they didn't cause them to have to swear to allegiance to a man-made priest, so they attached themselves. You've got to make a difference between people coming out of denominationalism, and that's all they ever knew, and trying to get back the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice to doing things just as the New Testament authorizes. That took a year to years of their study. They had nobody to help them but their own uh, devoted desire to be obedient to the truth. And once they got on the course of saying the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice, they began to give up then a uh, man named Creeds. And this Philadelphia tradition of faith was one they gave up. And you find a number of people when you study uh, early restoration of history uh, come to that conclusion. People were far more dedicated to the Bible as the final authority religion in those days 
until they didn't realize a lot of the implications of what that meant if they would believe in practice than are today. People are wrong about what they believe today. Baptists don't believe what they believe today. Uh, if you look around about you, there will be the smaller groups among some of these, and that's one reason they're smaller in number, is because they more rigidly hold to the old doctrines of these people. And frankly, our secular society, the most that keeps beat up, say, God, oh, Saved in my sin rather than coming out of it. They don't pay much attention to anybody that says you must live a certain kind of life. And you must give up this and you must take on that, and that's what's involved in living the Christian life. Of course, from their viewpoint, it would be taking upon yourself what they consider to be the will of God is the way you live. First thing we'll deal with is that they say that a person is born dead in sin and cannot be cannot do one thing to rescue himself. If one is saved, it's because God has saved him from the foundation of the world. It's totally on God's side and nothing to do with man. And everybody else, all others, are lost eternally without a cause. Doing some looking around, I uh, tapped into this doctrinal statement called What Ripley Baptists Believe from the New Hope Ripley Baptist Church in Miley, Tennessee. And I'll just read a few things. They ask questions and they answer them. They're claiming their answers. And it's under the head, as I said, of what primitive Baptists believe. The first one is, what is the basic difference between primitive Baptists and other religious societies? The answer they give. The basic difference is the primitive Baptists believe in salvation by grace. There are really only two positions that a person that occupies this on this matter. One is that salvation is by grace, and the other is that salvation is by works. It cannot be a combination of the two. A person may say that he believes in salvation by grace, but if he sets forth, and listen, if he sets forth any act of man's will, such as repentance, faith, baptism, or hearing the gospel as a condition for obtaining it, then this position must be put on the works side. Every man that just believes that salvation is on the Lord, that it's by grace, and that nothing needs to be added to it. So you can see how that you cannot say that you must believe and do these things in order to be saved. You do that, if you're trying to appeal the works. It's holy grace for the Calvinistic concept of grace. Okay, the next question was, what do the Baptists believe about fallen man? Here's what they say. Adam willfully transgressed the law of God and therefore plunged himself and his posterity into a state of guilt and corruption. Romans 5, 12, and 19, they cite. Man in his natural state is now dead in trespasses and sins. It is just who won. And is unable to recover himself by an act of his own free will. So you see, in their minds, the gospel calls nobody. Because you can't act. We'll see more about what they mean by that maybe later. But you can't act to do anything. You can't choose to serve God. We'll, we'll leave that alone for a minute, but we'll look at what the Bible teaches on this matter of people being born dead in sin. Which is what we say when we talk about uh, having inherited Adam's original sin in the garden. It comes down through us just like our hair color our eyes and so forth come from our parents. Peter said it this way. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise to some being got slack. He's talking about his promise to return. He says he's not willing that the friend of the work, any, any one, any should perish. But that, in other words, all ALM should come to repentance. Now, that pretty well knocks that head, unless you've got on your Calvinist classes. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, Paul wrote that God would have all men to be saved. And then you'll notice in Hebrews 5 9, these are very familiar passages to those of us who are familiar with the New Testament. That he, Christ, became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. 
And then we learned when we were looking at the scriptures that Paul was given to comfort the persecuted Christians and that's the night for the that's loving you for one name. The Lord comes back and will be taking vengeance on them that know, okay, no, no, that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we read also in 1 John 2, 3 and 4. John says to Christians, so to everybody that's a member of the church, hereby we do know, hereby we do know, that we know, against this came of the knowledge, that we do know Him. But it's conditional, love that. That is a lot of conditions. If we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar. And, and the truth is not uh, in him. In 1 John 2, 3 and 4. We, we learned early on in Acts 10 and look more to Peter. We're going back over again to the church in Jerusalem with the conversion of Corinthians household. God's no respect to persons. And in Colossians 3, 25, that same idea is presented by Paul to the church of Colossae. Now, what are we going to conclude from the scriptures and the scriptures only? Therefore, God does not ordain some to be saved and others to be lost. There's not one thing in the world with eyes or sight can do anything about it. That's just false doctrine. It's just Calvinism. And we must understand that taking the Bible and the Bible only, like that one doctrine, becomes quite clear that man has the ability to understand the gospel and to realize that the gospel has certain conditions. Man must free, freely obey. Must use his will and submit to it in order to be saved. And yet none of that has to do with trying to be salvation. Not a bit of it. None of it is trying to say, I deserve heaven because I did this. Not at all. Uh, it's a matter of accepting the grace of God as it is through the faith of Christ that is the New Testament system. I'm not submitting to God. <coughs> That's one thing. Then another point is that they teach that all saints will be preserved and will persevere in grace under the heavenly glory. And not one of them will be finally lost. You can find that the creeds. In other words, if it's all up to God, not up to man, then those he's determined to be saved are saved. Period. Anything you do one way or the other in order to be saved. That's impossible in their view of things. And that if you have been determined in the mind of God before the world began that you would be saved or all the elect, there's nothing you can do to become a part of it by any action or choices you may make. You're not going to be lost because it's all of God. None of you. It's up to God. But here's what the Bible has to say on that. There are most, well, most, most of the New Testament, as you know, written to individual Christians or to churches, those Christians here. And the interesting thing about it is, it's written to warn people of what they can lose. It's written to say, if you don't act properly, you can fall from grace. Galatians 5, 4, whosoever you are that is justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. But well, you can't fall from grace. Why is that there explicitly stated? That isn't just so many words. So we need to look at that. So there's absolutely no possible chance, mark that, no possible chance for a Christian to be lost. Why do we have so much of the New Testament saying, be careful? See, that you walk circumspectly, not the school, and be wise, and deep in the time, the days are evil. Warning after warning after warning. In fact, we have. In John's writing, one another familiar with the Testament students, in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, this is the Christians now, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are not of God, because many false prophets are going out before the world. Now, why is that, why does that have any meaning at all? To a person who is saved by God without any acts in the mind or body in his part because it's all up to God and he's not going to lose a one that he saves. Why do you have that passage in there? That says I have a responsibility. 
Even though I've been saved and become a Christian, I have a responsibility to do what the Bible says, is be faithful as a member of the church. Thus you have 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that we are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We see, too, in Luke 8, 13, our Lord's own teaching, as he talks about these things, that some people believed, but they didn't have a temptation. They fell away. That makes no sense whatsoever. If a person cannot so sin, the child of God should be eternally lost. It makes no meaning. It's nonsense. In John 6, 66, concerning what the people of that time, some of them considered to be a hard saying of Christ, Scripture reads from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. John 6 66. How can you not walk any longer with Christ in your belief and obedience to his teaching and still say you walk with him? Still say that he's your Savior. You can't do it. These words again are nonsensical if they don't say you have a responsibility to keep yourself in the love of God and to try to put to test those spirits. Because many lost prophets have gone out of the world. Then, then in Galatians 5, 4, I've already mentioned that, where the Judaizing teachers from Trump and Jim Doc Christians say you must be circumcised to keep the law, you can't be saved by Christ. And Paul just came right out and said, Just whoever you are that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You can't get plainer than that. If you can't fall from grace, then uh, Paul was wrong. But I really think the entire cause of Paul, and they have what somebody else said. John, John 3, 3 through 5. There's, there's no one that's in the kingdom but the those who have been regenerated. That's the whole point of John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5 in our Lord's conversation with the demons. He was talking about how to be regenerated. And if you're born of water and the Spirit, you're regenerated. But the Calvinist says that that's the case even for their view of regeneration. Then there's nothing you can do to be lost. But that's not the case. Some people, the reason I bring that up, will say, well, they're lost and they're worth saving. That's usually the way it goes. Uh, they fall away, they never were really with God. But there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that's the case. People can obey the truth, and in time of temptation and uh, trying to their faith, they can give up and stop and go back into the world. These Baptists believe in uh, what's called foot washing, is a church ordinance, and they. And they decide how often they're going to observe. Sure. There are different groups that will carry on what they call as quote for the Washington quote. They miss the whole idea of our Lord, John 13, washing the disciples' feet. The text there makes it very clear that he who would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven is going to be your servant. And our Lord says, now here's what I mean by that. So he took what was a common menial task usually to serve for the service of the house. And remember, he's the Lord. His disciples, he many the Lord. And yet, he washed the disciples' feet. There was no performance. It was the dirty feet of the disciples that our Lord washed. And that would go on any house. When travelers that day and time with their sandals, most of them walking. When they would come to the house, it was customary to refresh those people by washing their feet. But it was also a slave or some sort of servant who usually did it. That's, That's the reason Peter, Peter was so resistant to the Lord. Lord, you're not washing my feet. The Lord did what he normally did, put Peter in his place and don't wash your feet, you're going to have a lot with me. And then Peter ran the other direction, Lord, not the feet only, but all of me. He said, well, we'll wash what needs washing. <laughs> That's your feet. That's the whole point. It's not an act of worship. That's where they put it. They put it in the worship assembly and they carry on this foot washing. That's an act of worship. But when you look in the scriptures, scriptures you'll, you'll find out that the scriptures place washing of feet as an act of service, not as an act of worship. When Paul is talking about the widows, and uh, he's talking about verse 9 of 1 Timothy 5, where he talks about that not a widow be taken into the number of the three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Listen, well reported of for good works. 
She's she's brought up children. So he's giving qualifications like for Dickie, like for like Elk. She, she's going to be in the, in the number that's provided for by the church. Does she have a lot of strangers? Does she have a lot of these saints? Notice that the Holy Spirit took the washing of feet and placed it in the area of service. Not as an act of worship. Not as some sort of sit up here and somebody comes along and washes their feet. In fact, I guarantee you, those people who go through there are going to already have washed their feet perfumed before they stick their feet up there and have anybody else up before the whole congregation see them do that. That's just the whole point. The idea is, he who would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. Today we might say it's the person who carries a bit man. It's the person that changes the dirty sheets. You must be willing to be that lowly and humble in service to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord says, let me show you how to do it. So the idea of their using this as an act of worship just won't work when you take the totality of what the Bible teaches on these matters. The, the big thing that I would emphasize if I were going to try to work with them in a Bible study, and, and by the way, they, they won't, if they really know their doctrine, they both have said about it. Because there's no drawing power to the Bible to a person who's predestined and lost. It won't do any good. They do not believe that when some preacher stands up here like this and preaches, that it's going to do the alien sinner. Because he didn't pass past the sins. And as we used to say it, he wouldn't do good if he could. He couldn't do good if he would. Because he's dead. He's separated completely. There's nothing there from him. Well, then how is he going to be saved? God in his mind before the world was predestined. This group over here be saved. And this group over here be lost. You didn't have a choice in the matter, either way. You're going to be saved, you're going to be lost. Or your spouse says, I don't want to be lost. Somebody over here may say, well, I don't care anything about nobody who says what's this. There's a difference. It has nothing to do with your salvation. God's already determined to be saved. God's already determined to be lost. So there's not a thing in the world you can do either way in order to be saved or be lost. If you're predestined back in the beginning, before the world was, be lost or saved. Well, then how do you know you're one of the elect? Because the elect of those that God predestined before the world was to be saved. How do you know you're one of the elect? You can't learn from the Bible because you've been born of the world having inherited Adam's original sin. You can't. You're trying to know good things at all. Well, the Bible's a good thing, so you're not trying to do it. How do you going to know it? It's a great person who's here. And he's going to come down, and you're going to have some sort of experience that you say is the Holy Spirit telling me I'm one of the elect. And, and so, so they would come before them the church and declare this is this, this happened to me. And they would vote on to see if everybody agreed, at least in many churches they did, that this was an act of the Holy Spirit signaling that more worldwide this man would determine to be one of the elect. Everybody said, all right, you're one of the elect. Well, guess what? If anybody declares he would, when God comes down to do it, if anybody declares he's one of the elect and starts doing God's will, who's going to say what? You, you have, have to be one of the elect. You would be doing God's will. So, so it really makes itself to the back and forth. But the, I, I'm not exaggerating this. This is their doctrine. Uh, notice what they say here on the question, did not Jesus die for the human race? Listen, very first word, no. But they're wrong. The scriptures will not support that idea. They say, Jesus said he came to the world to do the will of his Father. And that will was that he should save all people who were, who were given to him. And they put riches in the land. Even before the world began, John 6, 37 39. Now, I'm signing these verses because they do. That doesn't mean it's a portion of our Jesus came to save, and they capitalized, his people from their sins. And he did it. He scripture. He died for sheep, not for ghosts. He died for sons. For the, for the sanctified, sanctified for the brethren, for the church, for the children. He saw the prevail, his soul was satisfied. You see, how can they say that? Did you see in their mind and their heart? The elect of those God before the world was determined to be saved, and they have no choice in that. So when Christ came, he only died for those who were before the world was determined to be saved. And that's the reason they say, 
Do not Jesus now follow you for us? And they say, no. He only died for those God before the world has elected to be saved. Do the primitive Baptist deny that Christ, Christ died? Christ died for the world. No. no. We believe that the world for which he died was the world of his elect. The world of souls for which he died do not have their trespasses imputed to them and therefore cannot be condemned. Which, Which means that when he said, this class over here, before the world was, before you even were believed in your mother and daddy's eye, you were determined that I would God be saved. When Christ came to the world, something led to die, and that's who you something led to die. You folks over here who God determined to be lost before the foundation of the world, you died for you. You die for your own, and then you do about your situation. Now, now that's why that you come down and find some of these churches years and years ago, more of them consistent with just you. And I mentioned this many times before, had the old orders meetings. They're trying to find out if they want to be So the preachers would exhort them to come up, and they'd get to the orders meetings, and they would mourn, and they would pray for their sins. And they would pray until, as they were exhorted to, pray through. For the orange means they pray through. Now, now I understand I'm not saying all this is logically fit in with what they do, but that's what they teach, what they did. Thus, they're trying to find out because they can't learn it from the Bible, from the Old God, if they're one of the elect. Thus, there they are. Mourning over their sins, but they don't know what to do. Because they can't do anything once you say. And I think I mentioned a number of times of the young preacher boy whose cousin was going to that strike of religion. And they're always saying, when you come forward with the word of exhortation, these who are striving to pray through God. As a believer, it's obvious he's repentant, so guess what this member of the church here they said to him when he came up to exhort him. As a believing, repent of mercy, he came up and said, Now, I want to tell you this now. Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sin. Call on the name of And that other said, Well, I don't want to the most countless doctor when I you to do anything in order to be saved. And he won't allow you to do anything or leave him to do anything in order to be lost. Because God determined before the world was that you either lost or saved. And your will in the matter doesn't have a thing to do with anything. Now notice this, and don't quit. Another question. How do you know that all of the elect will respond to the call of the Spirit? And it's very simple way to answer it. All that God chose and predestinated are also called. Those that are called are also justified. So we're called effectually. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. What does that mean? Here's what I said a moment ago. That they announced that they have had this experience that they were involved. They have responded. They have listened to the Spirit. But the thing that really, that really set the restoration movement, two things I'll say at the first, that really set it going, was the call to renounce all men made creeds. Go back to the Bible, the Bible, these are the really faithful. The next thing that came out of that was for people like this. You don't have to wonder. You can think what the Holy Spirit said right here. And you can read the will of God as to what He requires of you to be saved. And then they would do something like this. I even have the Bible at all given to us of God for the reason 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says it was given and then claim you can't understand it all over. And then you tap that up with Joshua saying, Choose you this day who you will serve. But it's for me and my house will serve the Lord. That's those two things made such an impression upon that Calvinistic world divided in denominations and various creeds, prayer books, prophets, synods, and so on. That the people just play no common sense. And when we have this home, every one of us believe it to be the will of heaven. So why don't we take it and it alone? 